many come in at noon. <laughs> but it looked like a good number of you remembered to do that. Uh, we'll have a debate someday as to whether we should or shouldn't do that, but not right now. We'd like to welcome any visitors that we have with you, particularly if you remember to spring forward. And please sign our visitor book in the back with your name and address. I wasn't given any uh, specific announcements, but there are several in the bulletin, so we ask that you please pay close attention to those. And uh, now I ask for you to bring your prayers forward and prepare your hearts for worship as we listen to our prelude and we have the lighting of the candles.
Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and we cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors for ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his only son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all of our sins. As a call and ordained minister of the church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare unto you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue with the opening prayer.
And this is not your own doing. It is, a, it is the gift of God, not the results of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Covenant means? 
That means promise. It means a promise. God made that promise because He loved us and He promised He would never do that again. Have you ever seen a rainbow? Yeah? Beverly, have you ever seen a rainbow in the sky? No? Okay. Well, you will one day. You'll get to see one. Have either of you ever made a promise? Have you made a promise? Have you? Did you keep that promise or did you break it? You kept the promise? That's good. I, I, I'd like to say I've kept every promise I've ever made, but that would not be true. I had good intentions, but I didn't do it. But God made this promise, and he sent the rainbow to help him and us remember that promise. Marvin, do you think the rainbow is a fraud? Yes, it is, because we can always rely on God to keep his promises. He never breaks a promise. That's right. Can you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your rainbow and the promise you made. Help us to remember that you love us and we can always rely on you through each storm in our life. Thank you for yet another frog. Amen. Israel's downfall. What happened? 
They're out in the wilderness. You notice when the biggie was reading that text, they said, uh, there's no water here or food. And then the next line, we hate that vegetable food. What's that? The manna. They don't want the manna. They wanted the leeks and the onions and, the, and everything they had back in Egypt. That didn't have the way it works. You couldn't hit the weight until you got out of there. Then you look back in hindsight, oh, that was that was the golden age. That was a, you forgot you were in slavery. You forgot they beat you. The tribe you got, you didn't give you straw to make that go either gather your own straw and make bricks out of. And all that terrible stuff. 430 years they prayed to get out of there. And finally they're out. And they can't wait to go home. You know, you know what I'm talking about? It's like a kid who comes home back to mom and dad's live, I suppose. They couldn't wait to get out of there. And then they can't wait to get back. Got that thing. Anyway. I digress. <laughs> Different sermon for a different day. <laughs> but you see where this ends. It doesn't end up well for anybody. And unfortunately, that same scenario is how Satan tempts us to sin as well. Somewhere deep down in our, our soul, our being, we wrestle with this. Is it going to be my will I want done or God's will to be done? Most of the time, I lobby for my own will being done, and I hope that God's thinking the same thing I am. That usually doesn't work out so well either. But that's the human way. And when I'm ungrateful to God for everything God has given me, it inevitably leads to rebellion. You and I fall the same way that Lucifer fell, that Adam and Eve fell from God's grace, that Israel fell from God's grace. We fall the same way. Now, in the Peanuts cartoon, Lucy and Charlie Brown shed the light on a different facet of the problem solution dichotomy. Lucy says to Charlie Brown, You know what the whole trouble with you is, Charlie Brown? Charlie Brown answers, No, and I don't want to know. Leave me alone. And he walks away. So Lucy shouts after him, the whole trouble with you is that you won't listen to what the whole trouble with you is. <laughs> Professor Lucy teaches us then the solution begins with listening. Listening to the truth about who we are. As one pastor theologian put it, we are all artful dodgers. You ever notice that? We're good at dodging the question. We're good at dodging stuff. You know, we let the arrow pass right by us and we blame somebody else. I didn't do that. That was you. You forgot that. I didn't forget that. I didn't forget that. And we do it. And, and kids know this. And they pick that up just like that. You're hardly ever responsible for anything. You know, you can never have to teach your kid a lot. No. Never have to teach them, you know, would you please just trash your room and leave it at us? No, don't have to teach them that. You ever have to teach them, you know, to be respectful? Yes, you do. You ever have to teach them to be responsible? Oh, yes, you do. That's a lifelong project for a lot of people, learning to take responsibility for themselves. We live in a regressive society. That's a, a term I don't mean uh, we are kind of falling apart. But what regression is, human regression is when you want a quick fix for everything. Anybody ever see that in the news, something happens? Maybe a tragedy happens. What's the first thing you want to do? Somebody, everybody wants a quick fix. Just make the pain go away. Don't let this ever happen again. They don't want to look at the, the underlying reasons things happen. Just fix it. I don't care what you have to do. I'll give up my liberty. I'll give away my amendment rights. Just make this stop. Huh? Quick fix. And then they blame everybody. The blame game. That old finger goes to everybody. It's not going to look at me. It's all you guys. There's somebody else out there. That's their problem. Right? So you want a quick fix and you blame everybody. And then there's a, a chronic sense of anxiety in society. It never quite seems to go away. Just bubbling under the surface all the time. And then, and then there's people in society who love to keep that anxiety going because they can get political capital out of that. And they can convince people that if they just did such and so, they can help get rid of the anxiety. But they need anxiety in the system so they can get what they want. So that anxiety never goes away. There's never real peace, calm, tranquility. Just you get up, breathe a fresh breath of air, and say, wow, today everything is right in the world. 
We don't have babies like that hardly anymore, do we? You may have had, you know, 40 years ago, 50 years ago when you were a child, right? You got up in the morning and said, well, what are we going to do? I'm going to ride my bike. I'm going to your grandma's house and get a piece of pie. You know, I'm going down to the and get the stones. I'm going to go fishing today. Those were good days. You had good days. But now, we don't have good days like that very many, do we? Hardly any. All of those are signs of triangulization, you know, where you get two people to come together and then the third person, poof, they're on the outs, right? When you get close to this person, move somebody else away. That's triangulization. People want to triangulate everything to keep some people close to you and to push others away. So there's not a harmony and unity. There's disassociation and disharmony. And somebody always being on the outside looking in. That's a part of it too. We know that. That's deep in the flesh of human beings. It's a source of nagging irritation, a source of hostility and anger, a source of hatred, one for another. We're all artful dodgers. If you and me are the problem, it follows then that we cannot be the solution. Does that make rational sense? If we're the problem, we can't be the solution. solution has to come from outside of ourselves. Rather than admitting I am the problem, we're more likely to confess that, you know, the problem really is, I just have some bad habits I've got to work on. I'm just under construction, really. That's all it is. And so we might say, you know, I'm blind. Then keep my promise. I'll work on that, right? I'll try to do better. I like, so I'll stop doing, I'll stop lying. Yeah, I stole a candy bar from the convenience store. I better stop doing that. I was driving too fast. I got a ticket. So I'll try to slow down. So I'm not, I don't endanger myself. I come first, of course. And then maybe I don't endanger anybody else. Because I'm just a great guy, right? That's what we think. I'm a great woman. I'm a great guy. Sure, it's just need a little work. Whatever the problem is, then defining the solution is simply I'll do better. I'll try to stop doing the bad thing. I'll try to do better. Try to be a better human being. Salvation then comes, becomes nothing more than doing good and avoiding bad. Such a solution doesn't even need Jesus. Oh, that's a beautiful part of it. You don't even need Jesus. You just got to do a little better. And everything comes out of hunky glory. For if Jesus is a part of the equation, he simply becomes a model for what doing good looks like. This watered down cheap grace, this cheap salvation, or works righteousness, it comes when we don't acknowledge that our sin, that is, our rebellion against God, is deep down, rooted, fundamentally in our flesh. The primary problem is not the things we do, but that we are us. We are sinful, rebellious human beings. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in Cost of Discipleship, one of the books that he wrote, um, Really, to the community of faith, he wrote that in, in Life Together as what, what it is to live in a community of faith. And he wrote that during the Second World War. And Yervanov was killed five days hung at Hitler's, Hitler's uh, order, five days before the Allies liberated Germany. He was moved to Flossenburg, the place where they killed people, and he was hung with others. But he wrote The Cost of Discipleship because in the, own, the German church in which he lived, they were big time in the cheap grace. And he wrote, cheap grace is preaching, the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. Baptism without church discipline. Communion without confession. Absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ. Living and incarnate. Costly grace is a treasure hidden in a field. For the sake of it, a man will gladly go and sell all that he has. It is the pearl of great price, the buy which the merchant will sell all his goods. It is the kingly rule of Christ, for whose sake a man will pluck out the eye which causes him to stumble. It is the call of Jesus Christ at which the disciple leaves his net and follows him. Costly grace is the gospel, which must be sought again and again. 
the gift which must be asked for, the door which a man must knock. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow, and it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it costs a man his life, and it is grace because it gives a man the only true life. It is costly because it condemns sin, and it is grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it is costly because it costs God the life of His Son. Costly grace is the incarnation of God. In the 21st chapter of the book of uh, Numbers, we are not told if the poisonous serpents disappear, only that God provided a way for those who had been bitten by the serpent to live. In the same way, Jesus being lifted up, exalted on the cross, does not magically take away our human rebellious tendencies against God, that is, our ongoing sinfulness. But through Jesus, God provides a way for the bitten by sin to live in a holy communion with God the Father, forgiven now in this life and as a part of the new creation that is to come. Having been washed in Jesus' blood, God's wrath passes over us and has landed full force upon the Son. For this reason only, we have life before God in Jesus' name. John reveals the antidote in this way. A verse that you know oh so well. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Those who believe in Him are not condemned.
he ascended to the hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended to heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, and the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, and for all people according to their needs. Dear Spirit of God, we come to you with great thanksgiving for the gift of faith. You have given us the light in our souls that has made it possible for us to come out of the darkness and into the light of our Savior, who has reconciled us to the Father through his holy sacrifice on the cross. As we consider St. Paul's words in Ephesians this morning, Help us to remember that the work of salvation and redemption has nothing to do with ourselves, but everything to do with God's great love for us, the work of his hands. Lord, in your mercy. In our Father God, in the Old Testament book of Numbers, you punished the Israelites and ungrateful and sinful people with snakes. When they acknowledged their sinful ways and repented, you commanded Moses to make a broad snake and place it on a pole. Those who were bitten by the snakes had only to look at the bronze snake to be saved from death. So many times our hearts are unresponsive to your will. We reject the Holy Spirit who longs to live with us. When we realize our sinfulness, we look to the cross of Jesus, and there we find the very survival of our souls. Help us to keep that holy, blood-stained cross close to our hearts, that we may be aware of our sinful state and the sacrifice you made to save us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray that our church may be a haven for all who desire to follow Christ. Inside these walls, may those who are seeking you find grace in your hearing, in hearing your word, and in joining with us at the communion table to receive our Lord's precious body and blood. Father, help us to welcome all who enter here with open hearts that they may, may feel Christ's love, forgiveness, and peace. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Father, turn us away from the greed and selfishness that has become so intrusive in our country. Lead us to value the human conditions more than wealth and riches and what we can gain for ourselves. Help us to turn our hearts back to the beliefs and values that in the past have identified as a caring and loving people. Lord, in your mercy. In your Dear Savior, you hold a special place in your heart for all children, and on this day we offer our prayers for those children throughout our world who are suffering, those who live in countries at war, those whose families and homes have been destroyed by natural disasters, those who are hungry, those who, because of unequal opportunities, are undereducated, those who are caught up in dysfunctional families, those who are suffering from illness and disease, and those who are neglected and abused. Help us, dear Jesus, to reach out to all children who are in need of our help and to do all in your glory. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Healing, Lord, be with those who are most in need of your strength and mercy during their time of suffering. Those who are sick and those who are dying, those who are disheartened and those who are grieving, we commend to your care our church members who are homebound, those on our prayer chain and those who are named in our bulletin. Be with these your faithful servants and with all for whom we offer now our silent prayers. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. In your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, O Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. I'm trying to share your lives and Christ on you.
Thank you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you gave your son both as a sacrifice for sin and a model of a godly life. Enable us to receive him always with thanksgiving and to conform our lives to his. Through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. Amen. Amen.